Ladies and gentlemen, tonight it's really a big pleasure because I have a fellow author and fellow podcaster on the CX Goalkeeper podcast. Bob Asman is together with me. Hi, Bob. How are you? Greg, I'm great. Thanks for having me on your podcast. I love your podcast and listen to it often. I appreciate you uh, asking me to join today. I am super thrilled. Thank you very much. And I give back to you the compliments because you have also an outstanding podcast and I often listen also to, to your podcast. Therefore, we will share all the information in the show notes. We will deep dive a bit later into your podcast. But now let's, let's really kick off the discussion. As usual, before we deep dive and we start the game, today we are going to speak about corporate social responsibility and sustainability. We would like to learn more about Today's top player, Bob Asman. And therefore, Bob, could you please introduce yourself? I'm glad to introduce myself. So, Greg, I spent, um, um, wow, over 40 years in corporate America, so to speak. Um, in early in my career, I spent a lot of time focused on all kinds of different business functions. And then um, maybe 20 or 25 years ago, I, I found a niche in customer service, global operations, and then customer experience as it evolved over time. We didn't call it customer experience back then. And uh, worked in a number of different large corporations, building global operations, and then moving into customer experience strategy and design when we combine the service organization to align that strategy. And then uh, went off on my own, uh, just a boutique uh, consulting firm working across multiple industries and at the same time so moving from practitioner to consultant I'm also uh, an academic where I'm involved in uh, the teaching profession at the University of Minnesota's Carlson School of Management and the Rutgers University School of Business and I'm teaching at the graduate and undergraduate levels in experience design service management and uh, global operations, as well as supply chain and operations management. Thank you very I'm much. I'm supposed to be semi-retired, Greg, supposedly semi-retired. <laughs> <laughs> but I really appreciate that you are still active in our community because you are bringing a lot of value, not only with uh, as a lecturer, but also as an author. We wrote together two books, Customer Experience 3 and Customer Experience 4, uh, published by Writing Matters. And there we came into contact and we stayed in contact. And I had the pleasure also to, to join your, your podcast a few months ago. Uh, to learn a bit more about you, which values drive you in life? So, I first of all, I'd say authenticity is really important in terms of a value, especially in my experience in being across uh, global organizations in geographically diverse areas, I think you have to be authentic in what you're presenting. And especially if you're going through transformations, if you're going through expansions, regardless of the actual situation that the organization is in, I think by being authentic, it really builds trust with the employee teams. And, and then you can share um, very uplifting messages as well as the difficult messages. And I would say closely aligned to that is the whole idea of leadership presence. I think as a value, you need to be present. And of course, the pandemic changed all of that for us, right? It changed our ability to be in person, but that doesn't mean you couldn't be present to the organization. That was still, um, we had to adjust, but you know, through Zoom and other, other avenues, but that real being in front, communicating uh, often and giving employees the information that they need, I think is so important. And so that presence, uh, when I when I go into consulting engagements, you know, oftentimes, as you know, you might end up talking to executives or the C-suite and so forth. And I always say, you know, what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk to the people that are working directly with customers on a daily basis, because there's so much information there. And that's the presence part of it. Um, and then I'd say, I, I, I use this uh, term just a few days ago in a different discussion where I try to be compassionate as well as passionate in whatever whatever I do. So compassionate in terms of, and I suppose empathy is another way to say that value, but compassionate in terms of understanding what 
uh, each of us as individuals is going through in our personal life, as well as our professional life, our careers and so forth. And then the passion is whatever we're doing in life, be passionate about it, whether I'm teaching or consulting or working in an organization, be passionate about it and share that passion with others. I think that's energy and that's contagious. Thank you very much. And you are speaking about passion. And I know you are also passionate about the topic we are going to discuss today. Today, And therefore, let's start the game and discuss about corporate social responsibility and sustainability. Uh, I think this is really an, an important topic. And also from a customer point of view, and uh, not from a corporate, uh, corporate point of view, it's extremely important. We always hear and get this information, the Gen, Gen Z, is really trying to select uh, companies that have similar values as they have and so on. But now that I have an expert on this topic, let's let's deep dive and try to understand better. What's your definition of corporate social responsibility and then sustainability? So I'm not sure I'm an expert, but I'm definitely somebody that's learning uh, as I go. Passionate. Passionate, exactly. So... I'll share with you the definition that I pursue, but maybe a little bit of background, Greg, might be important as to how I got here. And the what really has struck me is in my teaching, I oftentimes when we're teaching in supply chain or global operations strategy, especially at the graduate level, I often ask students, what's the purpose of business? And of course, I'm teaching at a business school. So very often the first words that are uttered are profit, um, making money. A lot of times customers come in there, which is really good. But social responsibility eventually is mentioned, but not always top of mind. And I'm generalizing a little bit. So as I was teaching this and, and I kind of wearing the two different hats of being in customer experience and then teaching um, in a business school, I thought, are we marrying those two together? Are, are we is our customer experience strategy reflective of, of a corporation's social responsibility strategy and vice versa? And it was interesting for me, Greg, that I kind of felt like I was bolting on cust uh, uh, corporate social responsibility to the strategy. I didn't feel that they were integrated. And so I started to do some research and I said, what is this definition? Is it is it the freedom definition of the purpose of business where it combines profit and corporate social responsibility? So what was interesting is, at least in the uh, small amount of research I did, there was some commonality among the definitions. So um, things like sustainability came up, uh, the inclusion of the health and welfare of the society, the expectations of stakeholders, a broad, not shareholders, but stakeholders in the organization. Um, were you following applicable laws and, and were you uh, following international norms of behavior that vary across geographies? And, and is it integrated as part of the organization? So to my earlier point, is it part of everything we do and is a part of all the relationships? And so that was common. Then I, uh, and you may have um, uh, talked to uh, Dan Pontefract because I also did some research on an article he wrote, actually, he was on one of my podcasts. And he talked about, uh, and I'm gonna quote him, a business approach that contributes to sustainable development by delivering economic, social, and environmental benefits for all stakeholders. The key point is sustainable development. So that kind of went to my whole concept of, is it a bolt on, You know, is it a flavor of the month? Is it a poster on a, on a wall somewhere, or is it really something that a corporation or organization is able to integrate to be successful? So I like that concept of triple bottom line where you look at the social, economic, and uh, environmental sustainability that makes up corporate social responsibility. And I also like the idea of dropping the word corporate, that it's actually social responsibility. It, it's extremely interesting because what, what you're sharing, it's also very much linked to authenticity that you uh, mentioned at the beginning as one of your values, because as human beings, we really should care about this, these topics. And the big question is why companies are not care, caring enough about these topics. And therefore, I really like the way you, you explain that because it's also very much linked to, to your um, 
to your um, values. And I think that that's extremely interesting. Also, having this contact with the new generation, with younger generation, uh, you as a as a lecturer, and therefore, uh, why is this topic so important? And in particular, nowadays, is getting more and more relevant. Uh, it's thank you for your comments, and it's a it's a great question. And there's just so much going on. And I think you know if you look at the a war in Ukraine, you look at the pandemic, you look at supply chain issues, you look at um, uh, unemployment, you look at um, some of the areas in the world where where famine is a real problem. It, I think the issue is that there's so much going on that that organizations almost were, were forced to some extent to kind of stand back and say, we have to think about things differently than we have in the past. And and whether the pandemic did that or whether the pandemic was an accelerator for that, I, that, that, that part doesn't really matter to me. What matters to me is that we're moving in a direction that says we need to incorporate this. And, and for me, then taking it the next step to say, well, wait a minute, we always talk about experience design and customer experience design and employee experience design. Well, what are we doing to incorporate those those elements of social responsibility into the experience strategy. I, I often look at it this way. Uh, when, you, when you attempt to learn a language that you've never learned before, I've been taught that you'll know you actually know the language when you stop translating it from your native language to the new language you're trying to learn. So in your brain, you're saying, okay, I'm trying to learn Spanish. So I'm, I'm thinking in English, translating it in Spanish, and then I'm talking. You know you really know Spanish when your mind doesn't translate anymore. You speak fluently and you speak Spanish or whatever the language is that's not native to you. So I look at social responsibility the same way. As long as we continue to view it as something of an initiative or a corporate directive or something that uh, the shareholders, by the way, I noticed on a lot of different shareholder documents recently as as uh, quarters closed, that there were a lot of proxy votes around social responsibility. As long as it's that way, I mean, there's that component to it, and that's important. But as experienced professionals, what are we doing? What are we looking at in terms of strategy that's different? And that's where I think the imperative part comes in, that we have to do something to look at experience strategy differently, look at exper uh, employee experience strategy differently differently than we have in the past. Thank you, Bob. It's it's really interesting how you are explaining that, and also this this different uh, this different view on on the topic, and also this additional relevant topic for uh, for uh, for customer experience or for for employee experience. But I fully agree that it's important. But let's be honest: uh, companies, corporates need to talk about financials. Need to ensure that uh, marketing is work is working well. Now, brand experience is uh, is a big topic. Then we speak about diversity. We speak about inclusion, and then everything what what you shared. Uh, in addition to all the problems that we have, uh, we don't have enough employees, and um, we need to take care of the different generation. How can organizations effectively integrate uh, corporate social responsibility or sorry, social responsibility into their business? <laughs> so I think one of the things to start with is, is the discussion taking place? And by the way, I agree with you 100% about the multiple priorities that organizations have. Um, I remember having a conversation with a leader of mine in the past and and um, I said to the leader, I, I asked him a question. I said, look, do you want good service rates or low costs? And his answer to me was both. And so, uh, and, and, and I was in operations. I knew the answer was going to be both. But the reality is, is that's what we're faced with now. Do, you know, we have all these priorities. What do you want us to do? And I think what we have to start with is, is the conversation even taking place in an organization? Is leadership talking about it in, in, a, in a way that's really sincere and meaningful? So I've looked at a number and studied a number of organizations that you can see the difference between an organization, and I'll give you an example, that, that incorporates 
um, social responsibility. So if you've heard of Bombas, who's the sock manufacturer for every pair that's purchased that one is donated, that's in their culture. That's been there from the beginning. It's not a bolt on. That's how they develop um, their approach. And there are many others like that, as opposed to, and I won't name any other organizations that aren't doing this, but as opposed to organizations that look at this as, oh, this is a good marketing idea. People will like the fact that we're socially responsible and they'll buy more from us. Well, that's not convincing to me. So I think to your question is, first of all, are you having the conversation at all in your organization? And is it, an off, speaking of values, is it an authentic conversation or is it a way to make more money? And by the way, that's an interesting conversation I have with students quite extensively is which comes first, the chicken or the egg? In this case, which comes first, social responsibility or profit of the business? And and that is a dynamic discussion that we have because it really is about the social responsibility side. Do I do I need the profit to be, in order to be socially responsible, or do I get the profit because I'm being socially responsible? And that I I fall on both sides of that equation. I hear both arguments, and that's a real challenge. But it goes back to knowing that that conversation is taking place and that it is at least on the list of priorities. To your point, all the things that are happening in an organization, is it even getting the attention it needs? And it might not be the highest priority for the organization, but are we starting to have the conversation? So that's, that would be one place I would start. I really like that, uh, starting the conversation, putting this topic on, on the priority list. And some companies, you shared one example, are already also taking actions. I do another example to, to introduce the next question, where I really would like to understand a bit better your view on that. Um, for example... A customer wants to have everything real time, wants to have the choice. Please send me ten, five pairs of shoes and I select one and four I will send back. And I know some companies are already thinking about that and they are sending shoes or other stuff with um, zero emissions and taking care of, of sustain, sustainability. However, it I can see at a real eye level a possible conflict through an exceptional customer experience, an amazing customer experience, and these two topics, because these are not always congruent together with customer experience. What's your view on that? <laughs> wow, that's a great question. I, I mean, I, I'll, my personal experience is I, within the last week, um, we got three separate deliveries from Amazon and in one day. And I thought to myself, and I'm, I'm not criticizing Amazon by any means, but I thought to myself, three different vans, three different packages, you know, three different boxes. I started going through my mind about could something have been done differently? But to your point, what does Amazon do really well? It does timely deliveries really, really well, sometimes within hours after you order it. And so, but also Amazon now gives you a choice to say, you know, get your deliveries, maybe your deliveries will be a day delayed, but get them all together, less boxes, less should be. So they're turning it back to the consumer to say, you know what, I don't need three packages delivered today. Why don't we consolidate them into one box and I'll take it tomorrow. And so I think that's an interesting twist on it is we don't realize as consumers about how much power we have in terms of our buying behavior. And so when when you when, again going back to my students which are you know many of these are 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 working in the corporate environments right now as as mba students i'll say to them would you buy patagonia that costs 20 dollars more than something else because you knew it was sustainable and it's interesting many said if i knew it was sustainable if i could if i trusted that it was made uh, in the proper way, and and I'm not again. I'm separating Patagonia away from this, but you know, was not made in a in a child labor uh, factory somewhere overseas. If I knew all of that, yeah, I would be inclined to do that. And ultimately, I might not be able to do that every time, but as a consumer, at least you're giving me the choice, and now I can start making those decisions. And so I kind of turn it back around to the consumer to say, we have the power to drive that. We have the power to hold organizations accountable to say, you know, I do want it in less boxes or 
I, I do want a sustainable jacket that was produced using recycled materials or whatever the case may be. But sometimes that's difficult because we like fashion. We like the latest trend. We like to have it right away. We, you know, so, so we're constantly balancing this and, and, and in an organization, I can imagine sometimes leadership probably scratching their head saying, we're trying to be sustainable, but the customer saying, I want it tomorrow and I don't care how many boxes it takes. So there is a bit of a push pull that says the consumer is going to drive a lot of this behavior by organizations and what they choose to buy and what they're willing to spend on it. And because it costs money, it, but I don't, I don't think it costs any more money than, than if we have a great customer experience. If somebody says, you know, I'm waiting two hours, but the reason I'm waiting two hours is because I'm getting a really good price on something. Well, that's a choice you're making. And that's a choice the organization's making. I really like your your example and also thinking about Patagonia. So, um, Maxi Schmidt from Forrester shared also the example that uh, um, Patagonia is also sharing tutorials how to repair uh, clothes or material in order not to waste that and throw it away and buy a new one. And they are really pro proactively sharing this information. And this is sometimes something that I really like. And from my point of view, based on my values, I also support. Uh, basically, perhaps also to understand it from a company point of view, is there an opportunity also to measure how sustainable or uh, a company is? Is there a way to measure this, this sustainability and, and the social responsibility of companies? There definitely are measurements that are available, ESG measurements that are, are out there and are being used. Some companies you know, might be reducing carbon gases. Some companies may be looking at recycling. Some companies might be looking at energy usage. There's there's a number of different ways that companies can measure that. So it's definitely out there. And uh, I've seen and heard a number of companies present um, that talk about their different approaches to it. And some of it, of course, is dependent on what is the product that they're producing? Are they are they producing energy and therefore what's their, are they reducing their carbon footprint? Are they producing products? Are they recyclable? I, one of the challenges that I've given my students is uh, find and research a sustainable organization that is committed to sustainability. And I'm amazed at the number of companies that are out there. One was a, a children's toy company that uh, made the toys from recycled plastic milk bottles and the toys were fantastic. They were colorful. And then, then the toy itself could be recycled again. I mean, that that's a coming full circle. So there's definitely ways to measure it. But Greg, as you know, if I said to you, how's the best way to measure customer experience, uh, we might spend another uh, two hours talking just about that, you know, NPS and CXI and CSAT and all the rest and all the debates going on around all those measurements. The similar thing is happening with ESG measurements in terms of, you know, what is the ideal one? Is there one in particular? I'm sure there is. Um, or, or is it applicable to a company and what are they trying to achieve? And I think that's the key is, again, going back to our earlier discussion about, is it part of the conversation? Well, if it's part of the conversation, how do we make it stick as part of the conversation? You measure it. What's, you know, um, and so if we're measuring it and we're holding everybody accountable for it, we're starting to think differently about it. And again, I my my approach on this is I'm not so much saying you have to convert your entire organization overnight. You have to do this and it's an imperative. I believe all of that, but I also am practical enough to know that there are small steps that we can take that can then create momentum, small wins in an organization that then drive us to do things differently than we had before. And that in turn helps embed it in the culture. Thank you very much. Um, I would love to ask 200 additional questions, but taking care of the time, we are coming to the end of this first half of the game. It was a bit longer, but it was worth it. And now <laughs> in the break, one question. You are a podcast podcaster. Can you share where we can find your podcast and what's about? Sure. So my podcast is called All Things Considered CX. And you can find it on all the platforms. Uh, I post the latest episodes on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also find them on my website at innovativecx.com. And the podcast is about customer experience, but 
I try to um, create a, what I call adjacent discussions. So, um, for example, at the beginning of, of the year, I always have somebody that looks at career development or an executive recruiter join me or somebody who helps people deal with stress or leadership coach. And so I try to bring the different aspects that help us develop as professionals um, in our field, as well as the actual components of CX. And then I love to have practitioners, but I also have been intrigued lately, Greg, by having a number of what I would call small tech startups uh, from around the world. And I really strive, I don't do it very well, but I strive to get international representation on my podcast. So we're not so US focused. And lately I've had some really intriguing tech startups, um, innovators come on and talk about what they're doing in the experience field. And um, yeah, there's probably a little self-promotion that they're trying to get their product out and sold, but but what they're talking about and the vision they have and some of the integration they're talking about, the technology beyond just AI, really fascinating. So three three major areas of topic, personal growth and development, uh, certainly customer experience, practitioner experiences and stories, and then what I would call kind of the tech side of the customer experience. Thank you very much. Thanks Bob. for asking. <laughs> It's sure, but now the call to action is missing. Therefore, I'm doing that for you. Please go to your preferred podcast platform and subscribe, follow um, all, all things considered. CX from Bob Asman. It's a great uh, podcast. Now, Thank you. Also available on YouTube, as yours is too. So, <laughs> Now, the second part of this discussion, it's about leadership. I shorten it a bit due, due of timings uh, from, from my point of view. Uh, one really important topic in, in, in leadership is resilience. What's your definition of the re resilience? You know, I, I'll put it actually in the context of the experience that customers have and related directly to leadership resilience is, you know, when you make a mistake with customers, it's, more about how quickly you fix the mistake and recover from it than it is about the actual mistake. If you recover really well, the customer will forget the fact that that there was a mistake. They they will forgive the mistake, so to speak. And because you recover well, you did it right. You you moved quickly to to solve the problem. And so for me, resilience in terms of challenges at leadership, in terms of things that go wrong is how quickly can you recover? How quickly did you learn from what happened and and recover from that and apply that learning so it doesn't happen again? Um, I, I think you can you can find yourself when you're in the midst of a fire. And, and of course, many of the roles that we have as practitioners, we're always fighting fires. I think you can spend too much time when you're in the midst of the fire trying to figure out what went wrong instead of putting the fire out. Let's get the fire put out and then let's solve it uh, after the fact so that we don't have the fire reignite. And to me, that's resilience is being able to come back, identify what the issue is, challenge, growth opportunity, whatever it is, and say, hey, this is this is how we can improve and let's not let this happen again. Not to say that all the challenges are going away, but at least that one is, is the fire is out and we're ready to move on. And what's your secret ingredient uh, being uh, a leader yourself? Um, you know, I'll share I'll share a brief story. When I when I went to work at at Thomson Reuters, I met with the CEO, and he said to me, "You know, we're a really successful company. We've been around for over a hundred years, and." And he said, you know, we don't often go outside and bring people in that aren't part of our career development path, but we brought you in for a specific reason. And he said, you know, don't don't act like you're a, a white knight in shining armor coming in to help Thomson Reuters. You know, I want you to listen and I want you to spend time listening in all areas of the organization, all business functions. And I want you to come back in 90 days and I want you to share with me what you learned. And I did that. And he said, you've accurately captured the essence of this organization. 
Now I think you're ready to help us transform to the next level. And that stuck with me, Greg, for that was that was a long time ago, 15 years ago or more, that listening is so important. And when I said to you earlier about when I go into consulting engagements or a new full-time assignment in an organization, the first place I want to go is let me go ride with the field sales organization or let me sit with customer service or whoever's defined as the front line that's dealing with customers and just listen. Don't talk, just listen and gather information. And every time I've done that, I notice that themes emerge and I, th I start getting the sense of the culture and where people are at and what their mood is and so forth. And it, it's been so beneficial to me. So it sounds pretty simple as a secret ingredient, but to me, it's, you know, listen first, talk second. Thank you very much. You spoke about your experience 15 years ago. Now it's let, let's jump 10 years in the future. In 10 years from now, we are back on the CX Goalkeeper podcast. What we are discussing about. I'm telling you all the things that I've been doing in retirement, Greg, is exactly what we'll be talking about. Um, <laughs> But, but it, 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 let's say, for example, I'm still, I'm still in customer experience. I hope what we're talking about is that we've really kind of achieved some of those breakthrough ideas that we've been talking about, that we don't have to convince people that CX needs to be justified in an organization. We don't have to convince leadership that employee experience is important, that it's it's integrated. We're speaking the language. We're not translating it. We're speaking the language and it's incorporated. And, and so is social responsibility that this is how we operate. This is the culture. And that that we're and that CX professionals are a valued profession that that people feel comfortable with and knowing this is a must have. I have to have marketing, I have to have operations, and I sure as heck have to have customer experience. And I hope it doesn't take us 10 years to get there. But I hope we're reflecting on that and saying what a wonderful journey it's been that this is happening the way it is. Let's hope for the best and you come back in, in the next few years and then we discuss exactly about, <laughs> about this topic. And this, this game is coming to an end, but we still have some time in the extra time. Uh, what's the best way to contact you? Um, I'm on LinkedIn. You can reach me there. Um, my website is innovativecx.com. And my email address is bob at innovativecx.com. So any way you'd like to reach me, uh, please feel free to do so. I'd love to have a conversation with you and continue the conversation that Greg and I have had here. So I really appreciate that. Thank you. And to the audience, you will find all the information in the show notes. And now we're coming to Bob's golden nugget. It's something that we discussed or something new to leave to the audience. So reflecting on that, um, I, I often close my classes uh, with some with some parting words. I call them parting words from the professor. And one of the things that I use is a quote from a movie uh, called The Imitation Game. And it is, and I'm, I'm going to paraphrase a little bit, but uh, it's the people you least imagine that do the things no one can imagine. And I really look at the power of the human element in being able to drive change in an organization. And we oftentimes might look towards leadership, but reality is we can change a lot of things um, within the organization with or without leadership's uh, support. So that, that quote always um, in, is impactful to me to think about what can you do what can you imagine that no one else has that you can change the world and change your organization? Thank you very much, Bob. The only thing that I can say is thank you very much for this outstanding discussion. Today, we learned a lot about corporate social responsibility and sustainability and some insights about uh, leadership. Please, Bob, stay with me to the audience for today. It's everything. I hope that you enjoyed this discussion as much as I did. As you know, we love feedback. Feel free to contact me, to contact Bob, share any feedback that you have on this podcast or on the topic that we discussed. Uh, for today, it's everything. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye-bye. If you enjoyed this episode, please share the word of mouth. Subscribe it. Share it. Until the next episode, Please don't forget 
we are not in a B2B or B2C business, we are in a human-to-human -human environment. Thank you!